What's up guys, hope you're having a good day. In this video, we're going to be breaking down all of the main card fights for this weekend's Fight Night card, headlined by Derek Lewis and Sergei Spivak. Now I know over the last few weeks I've been posting daily breakdown videos for individual UFC fights, but let's be real, this card isn't the best. It's on a, a difficult start time for most people around the world. Not the most interesting fights on the card. So I thought, you know what? People don't need to be messing about with the individual breakdown videos. I'll just drop a video for the whole main card this week. And hopefully it will make your life a lot easier. Also, let me know in the comments below. Do you prefer the individual daily breakdown videos for individual fights? Or do you prefer breakdown videos where we cover the whole of the main card like this one? Let me know. Anyway, want to kick off this video by giving a huge shout out to Mr. Jamal Hill, who came through for us big time on the last card. This fight was a classic example of how fight research can really give you a secret edge when it comes to betting. We said in that breakdown that if you would have just spent an hour research in that fight you would have seen that it was going to be very difficult based on recent performances for Glover Teixeira to take Jamal Hill down and hold him down. I've seen a lot of people since that fight take place come out and say you know props to Jamal Hill he looked amazing didn't realize that Glover would find it that difficult to take him down but if you would have just done a little bit of fight research it would have been glaringly obvious to you and in the breakdown for that fight we spoke about the specific reasons why it was going to be difficult for Glover to implement a grappling heavy game plan in that fight due to specific things that Hill had done in recent matchups which showed it was going to be difficult for Glover to get his grappling game going. So in today's video we're going to be breaking down all of these main card fights from this weekend's event but if you'd like to watch breakdown videos for all the prelim fights on this card just head on over to my website mmabettingtips.com there's a link for that in the description below i post breakdown videos for every single fight on every single ufc card on there so if you don't have time to do fight research yourself you could just head on over to my website and i'll give you like a general overview a nice strategy guide where i discuss and break down a fight in its entirety from a betting perspective which will hopefully give you the information you need to make better betting decisions and hopefully even earn some extra cash and so if you like that breakdown video on jamal hill glover last week you're able to earn money from that you'll probably be you know someone that will get a lot of value out of the breakdowns that i do on my site and of course the fights we'll be discussing in this video will give you some insight into, you know, the kind of breakdowns you're going to get on the prelim matchups. So if that interests you, if you don't have time to do proper fight research on all these fights this weekend, you're in good hands with me. I've been doing this a long time. I make a living from live betting UFC and I've got a lot of experience, man. Uh, betting is brutally difficult. Very, very hard to make money betting on anything in life. And, uh, you know, UFC is no different. And where you can give yourself a big edge is uh, is good quality fight research and i can help you out with that so check out my website mmabettingtips.com big shout out to jamal hill uh before we get into the breakdowns just want to let you guys know as i've said betting is brutally difficult so please remember to gamble responsibly nothing triggers me more than when you go on to twitter and you see everyone talking about how much they're winning you know how well they're doing everyone on twitter everyone online seems like a professional gambler but we know the reality is that it is a lot harder than that. It's very difficult to make money betting on anything. I make a living live betting the UFC, but in order to do that, I'm literally chained to my desk for, you know, 30, 40 hours a week researching fights. It is brutally difficult. So remember to gamble responsibly. All the information I share with you in this video is for entertainment purposes only. It's for my own, you know, my own experience, my own opinions. Uh, I'm just summarizing my research, sharing it with you. Not financial advice. Very important to gamble responsibly. And I guess one more thing is at the moment, there are spaces available in my live betting group. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can come to my website and click live betting tips and you can sign up there. Uh, I don't think the spaces are going to be around for much longer. I gave out a bunch of free trials in January and a lot of them a lot of people that had the free trials have already signed up for like full-blown memberships so i don't have many spaces available uh i do set a limit on the number of people in my live betting group because the more people that try the live bet the same thing at the same time the faster the odds decline and become suspended so i have a member cap and there's not many spaces available 
when the spaces do sell out they tend to be sold out for most of the year it has been a while since i've actually had uh, spaces available in my live betting group so this might be a last opportunity to join for a while um you know check it out i'm sure you'll like it if you don't send me a dm and we we'll obviously get you refunded no problem um nothing vengeance nothing gained as they say but for now let's break down the first fight on this entire card or on this entire main card which is one of the most interesting fights on the entire card in my opinion let's break down the fight between adam fugit and yazaku kinoshita so we'll start off by taking a look at the odds on this one so we can see that kinoshita pretty big favorite at average odds of around 1.30 which is going to be minus 333 for an implied probability of 77%. And if we take a look at the odds on his opponent, Fugit, he is around an average of 3.55, say 3.55, which is going to be plus 255 for an implied probability of 28%. So Kinoshita, massive favorite coming into this matchup, which is always interesting considering he's pretty inexperienced with only seven pro fights. And on top of that, he is making his UFC debut. He did obviously appear on the Contender Series, which I feel does in some way uh, prepare you for making a UFC debut. Obviously, this weekend's cards in the Apex Center and Kinoshita's fight in the Contender Series would have been in the Apex Center. So it's not as big of a jump, uh, you know, if you'd be making your debut, having never fought in the Apex, never fought under the bright lights of the UFC before. But still very interesting that... A young, inexperienced guy like Kinoshita, you know, only 22 years old, is a massive favourite in their debut. And in terms of the tail of the tape, Fugit is 34 years old, and we can see Kinoshita, like I said, is 22 years old. So that's quite a big age gap. Statistically speaking, the younger fighter wins around 70% of the time, 7-0, when there's an age gap this big in the fight. Which is interesting because when you look at the odds on Kinoshita, they carry an implied probability of 77%. So if you were purely betting based on age statistics alone, Kinoshita would have a 70% chance of winning. But his odds are actually even steeper than that. Now in terms of the uh, the, the the height, the reach, Kinoshita is 6 foot tall with a 71 and a half inch reach. Fugit 6 foot 1 with a 77 inch reach. So you can see there's a massive... You know, around the six inch reach advantage there for uh, Fugit, which is huge because he is primarily a striker. He does, you know, like to fight long, and it will obviously make it a lot harder for Kinoshita to get inside that six inch reach and land. So, just like the age difference gives Kinoshita a big statistical advantage over Fugit, the six inch reach advantage gives Fugit a big statistical advantage over Kinoshita, and I believe. Fighters that have a 6 inch or more reach advantage win around 65% of the time. So, two pretty big statistics there. One, for, you know, one in favour of each guy, um, which makes the tail of the tape pretty interesting in this one. But as we know, you know, statistics and, you know, all these kind of facts and figures... They're interesting, you know, they certainly help us make our mind up and, you know, they're things we need to consider when trying to predict the outcome of an MMA fight. But really the only place you'll see clarity and find truth and honesty is in the fight research. And when you match up, you know, when you when you study both these guys um, and you consider how they match up from a stylistic point of view, it's a very interesting fight because they're very similar in many ways. When you look at the styles of both guys, they're both primarily strikers. But not only are they both primarily strikers, but they have virtually the exact same kind of striking, which is very unusual. Like a lot of the time, if we have, you know, two strikers go up against one another, you'd have one with a predominantly boxing-based style against a kickboxer or, you know, a karate guy, taekwondo guy. This is one of those really rare examples where they are both virtually identical in their approach to striking. So they're both southpaws. They both like to fight with their hands down low in a wide Conor McGregor style stance. And they keep their chins up high and exposed, but they like to use their length to chip away at their opponents from a safe distance and they keep their hands low and use their length 
so that they can measure distance with their lead hand and see their opponents coming when the, when their opponent is coming forward to attack them and, and they use their ability to read their opponent and their ability to fight long to just just stay slightly outside the range where they can be hit the i guess the one main difference between these two is Fugit likes to lead the dance more than Kinoshita. Now, I'm not saying Kinoshita can't get aggressive on the feet, but he's much more likely to stand back and counter and react to what his opponent is doing. Similar to Conor McGregor in many ways. Like, you know where Kinoshita, uh, sorry, you know where McGregor would kind of stand in front of guys and do a lot of feinting, a lot of movement, but wouldn't necessarily always lead the lead the dance and attack when in kickboxing range he would wait for his opponent to make the first move and then mcgregor would look to slip back and counter with that big left hand it's very similar to what kinoshita tries to do um when it comes to fugit he's different in that he is more likely to be the aggressor and he likes to put controlled pressure on his opponents and then when they try and come forward aggressively to alleviate the pressure he's putting on them then he will back up, look to slip the shot, and land a counter. So there's some slight differences in the two styles of striking. But for the most part, very, very similar. When you have two guys that are very similar in terms of technique, who has the edge often comes down to fine margins. And the big difference between these two is that Kinoshita is definitely faster than Fugit and a lot better defensively. So there's just a real sharpness to Kinoshita's movement, technique and hand speed. Both guys like to be very technical and they like to fight long, but it's much harder to get inside on Kinoshita and land clean than it is on Fugit. They can get caught cold, you know, can, can get caught cold at times. Um, can get caught with shots he doesn't see coming. That can, of course, happen with Kinoshita as well, but it's far harder to get off and land clean and hard on him. Now, what's interesting about this matchup is the six-inch reach advantage for Fugit could close that advantage for Kinoshita. So what I'm trying to say is, if you've got Kinoshita fighting someone of a similar size to him, he's going to be, you know, likely going to be better defensively harder to get inside on you know and it's going to be harder to land clean and hard on him but with fugit having that six inch reach advantage kinoshita is going to have to be so much more on point with his defense the margin for error is so much smaller because fugit doesn't have to cover anywhere near as much distance as kinoshita to get inside and land so kinoshita the real difference between these two is his speed technique and defense but i am interested to see how much of a problem that reach reach gives kinoshita and if fugit's able to use it to you know chip away at kinoshita from a safe distance and make it difficult for kinoshita to get inside and land now in terms of grappling because both these guys are primarily strikers neither of them are particularly good grapplers now there's not tons of footage available on kinoshita's grappling to be fair there's not tons of footage available on fugit either but there is more footage available on fugit's grappling so we know more about fugit's grappling than we do kinoshita's what i would say is when it comes to takedown defense and ground game neither guy is very good and i'll play you a clip of kinoshita's takedown defense and ground game shortly so you can see it for yourself uh, but because they're strikers, the takedown offense and grappling is a huge issue for both guys, which you would expect, right? Especially with Kinoshita. With him only being 22 years old, he's going to have significant weaknesses. At 22 years old, you're not going to be good at everything. You know, you need more time to develop. And with Kinoshita primarily being a striker, it's no surprise that his grappling is an issue for him. And so... With Kinoshita having the edge on the feet and with both these guys primarily being strikers, the grappling is potentially a part of victory for Fugit. Now, Fugit's offensive wrestling isn't very good. His ground game isn't very good, but it may not necessarily need to be. 
Because if Kinoshita is very bad on the ground and Fugit can get him down and hold him down, Fugit doesn't need to be a particularly good grappler to potentially cause Kinoshita problems on the ground simply because of how bad Kinoshita is on the ground. And what's interesting about these two is that both of them are primarily strikers, but Fugit will mix things up and look for a takedown. He will look to take his opponents to the ground. Whereas I don't recall ever seeing Kinoshita try to take his opponents down. He wants to stand and strike. So what's interesting about that is, if the fight stays standing, Kinoshita is the better striker. He's going to win a decent percentage of the time. But if out of the two, Fugit is far more likely to mix things up and look to take the fight to the ground. And I do think he can cause Kinoshita some problems there. Let me show you what I mean with some footage. Now... Obviously, I am uh, recording this, uploading it to YouTube. I've got to play you some YouTube clips now from some other channels. So this video may get copyright flagged when I upload it. If it does, I'm going to have to like black out the footage that I'm about to show you when I re-upload it to get around YouTube's copyright issues. But hopefully, there's no problem here because ultimately, under fair use copyright laws, I should be able to show you these brief clips of Kinoshita and Fugit's past fights. But the YouTube copyright algorithm can be pretty aggressive. So what I'm going to show you here is the late stages of Kinoshita's fight against, uh, where is it, uh, Sumimura from November 2021 back in Rising. Now, it is important for me to mention that this fight was a while ago now. You know, November 2021 is over a year ago. And at 22 years old, you would expect Kinoshita to be making big improvements from fight to fight. A, a, you know, a guy 22 years old is going to be a sponge. And as a result, his takedown offense and ground game could be a lot better now in February 2023 than what it was in November 2021 but ultimately all we can do is make the best decisions possible with the information we've got available and from what i've seen of kinoshita's takedown events and ground game which you'll see now it ain't good so kinoshita is in the blue gloves here and what you can see is this is late in late on in the fight ah, actually important to remember this as well so i'm going to show you some footage of kinoshita late on in this fight um and I'm also going to show you some footage of Fugit later on. Pay attention to how much sharper Kinoshita looks than Fugit. Pay attention to his hand speed, his movement, his body language, his footwork. Later in the fight, he just looks way sharper than Fugit. So his sharpness, his cardio, it's going to hold up a lot better than Fugit's. But that's not the point of this clip. Uh, but it's something for you to think about when we, when we go and watch Kinoshita and Fugit side by side. So, here we can see... Um, Sumimura work for a takedown here he's in on this body lock and trying to hit an outside trip doesn't get it but as you can see you don't see Kinoshita go to underhooks there you know in this position you know he should be when he turns into Sumimura he should be working really hard to get underhooks there in this position you can see a lot of space there under the right armpit of Sumimura. I'm guessing there's space on the left side as well because you can see the position of Kinoshita's right glove here. He should be fighting for his life to dig underhooks here. And if he does fight really hard to get underhooks here, it's going to be incredibly difficult for Sumimura to get in deep in or deep enough in on his legs and hips to upset his balance and take him down. But he just doesn't really make any effort or any attempt to get underhooks at all. And because of that, Sumimura yanks his legs off the cage, completes the takedown straight into guard. So you can see uh, Kinoshita's takedown defense definitely a little bit sketchy there. Now he does a really good job of clearing his legs and popping back up to his feet but then gives up another very, very easy outside trip, which enables Sumimura to get to his back. So you can see here some pretty sketchy takedown defense from Sumimura. It was also very casual in how he gave his back up. And obviously, you know, giving up positions like this can get you into a lot of trouble. You know, his opponent, you know, for whatever reason, lost that position. He was working to get the body triangle locked up. Um... You know, he wasn't able to, he slipped off. But the point is, that little sequence there shows that Kinoshita's take down the fence. And, you know, MMA grappling 
is potentially a huge issue for him. Where he gave up very cheap takedowns there. At no point there was he fighting hard for underhooks. Which would have made it a lot more difficult for Sumimura to get those takedowns. And on top of that, obviously he gave his back up. And, and a far better grappler probably would have been able to maintain that back control position. And see out the rest of the round. You know, controlling Kinoshita from back control and, and winning a pretty dominant round. You know... I'm not saying Fuge is going to be good enough to capitalize on those kind of mistakes that Kinoshita made. You know, in Kinoshita's defense, he did a pretty good job working his way back up to his feet. But whenever we're betting on MMA, we've always got to let the odds do the work for us and consider the risk to reward ratio we're getting. You know, the odds on Kinoshita, 1.30, they carry an implied probability of 77%. Do you really want to be betting on a guy in this odds range who's young? inexperienced making his UFC debut and has issues like that with his takedown offense and ground game it, it probably isn't smart right maybe you bet Kinoshita this weekend you get lucky and he wins but long term it is very difficult to be profitable betting guys in this odds range that have weaknesses that big in their skill set I don't know if Fugit's going to be capable of making him pay for those weaknesses, but what I will say is Fugit does try to take guys down and hold him hold them down his ground game isn't great but when you're as bad on the ground as Kinoshita looks, it might not matter. So, what I now want to do is bring things back to striking. Because ultimately, both these guys are predominantly strikers. And, you know, this fight is most likely going to be a stand-up fight. Because we've got two strikers, right? And it does look like Kinoshita is difficult to hold down. You've just seen a little bit of footage on the footwork, the movement, the hand speed of Kinoshita deep into a fight. I want to show you some footage of Fugit deep into a fight as well. So Fugit obviously in the blue shorts. And you can real, really see with Fugit. There's, there's much more of a sloppiness and a slowness to everything that he does. With the way he kind of walks his opponent down. Doesn't really show them any respect. He carries his hands low. Chin up high and exposed. You know he puts himself in a lot of danger. With how fast and how technical Kinoshita is. You know, at this stage in a fight, you know, if, if this was Kinoshita stood in front of Fugit, you could really see Fugit getting lit up bad. You know, and in a moment, you're going to see him get, you know, going to see him get overly aggressive, you know, commit too hard and get caught clean and hard with a big counter. That, like I say, if he was facing a more technical, uh, you know, more dangerous striker, probably would have resulted in a knockout. You can see Fugit just comes forward, hands down low, chin up high. Not really moving his head, not respecting his opponent at all, looking pretty sloppy. And as a result, you can see his opponent is getting closer and closer to eating, uh, closer and closer landing clean hard shots. He lands this nice left hand there, which pay attention to Fugit's legs after this le left hand lands. So he lands this, this left hand here and look at his legs. His legs wobble just for a split second. He kind of shakes his arms out to get his head back in the game. Comes forward just as recklessly. You know, still has his chin up high and exposed, hands down low, looking very sloppy. And as a result, eats an even cleaner shot in a moment, which really gets his attention. There you go. Another clean left hand. And uh, you can see that hurt him because his body language completely changes with how he backs up and, and, and puts his hands down by his side. And that's when you then see him shoot a double leg. You know, him shooting a double leg there to me is a clear sign that those two left hands hurt him. Because he wasn't really committing very hard to grappling before that. And I think as soon as those two left hands landed, he was like, oh, hang on a minute. I can't afford to be in shots like that. Let's get this fight back to the ground. But there you can see, you know, Fugit will try to take guys down, especially if he's in trouble on the feet. So that is a path to victory for him against Kinoshita. But you can also see there's much more of a sharpness. You know, Kinoshita is just a way more refined striker. And so if this fight stays standing with how sloppy Fugit looks on the feet, especially deep in fights, Kinoshita is probably going to eat him alive. But... The threat of Fugit's grappling does make this one interesting. So I hope you made sense of all that and you found it useful. What does this mean from a betting point of view? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that you would have to be a crazy person to bet Kinoshita in this odds range. He's a much better striker than Fugit. Both guys are strikers, so Kinoshita probably does win. But there's absolutely no value in betting him at these odds because of those weaknesses that he has with his takedown offense and ground game. 
that means we've got to consider dog or pass here, right? Is Fugit worth a bet? Well, for me, if you bet Fugit, you're putting your money in a lot of danger for a few reasons. First reason being, Fugit's primarily a striker. Even though he does grapple more than Kinoshita, and he's a better grappler than Kinoshita, his grappling isn't great. On top of that, he tires out and slows down as fights wear on. And grappling can be exhausting, especially if you're a striker that's not used to using grappling heavy game plans. So even if Fugit did use a lot of grappling in the fight, it may just result in him tiring himself out and running into trouble late on when Kinoshita is the fresher fighter and Fugit's too tired to defend himself. On top of that, we also don't know if Kinoshi has made big improvements to his takedown offense and ground game since the footage we saw of him in November uh, 2021. So it's possible Kinoshi's takedown offense and ground game could be a lot better now than it was in that footage we studied of him. On top of that, there is no doubt that Kinoshita is the more dangerous striker out of the two. If you've watched his fight on the Contender Series, he scored a beautifully technical uh, knockout in the third round of his fight. Very reminiscent of a Conor McGregor style knockout, actually. Go check it out if you haven't seen it. UFC will definitely flag my video for copyright if I show it here. So go check that out. Uh, that is the kind of kill shot that with how bad Fuga is defensively, Kinoshita can absolutely land. So for me... This is one of those fights where the odds are pretty much exactly where they should be. Kinoshita should win this fight a high percentage of the time based on everything I've said. The problem is his odds reflect that. So there's no value here. For me, this is an easy pass. Let me know what you think in the comments below if you agree, if you disagree. But for me, I would stay the fuck away from this fight. So now we look at prop bets and over-unders. So the over-under on this fight favours fight not go into a decision and you'd have to agree with that right because with how much Fugit slows down as the fight wears on it's very likely that if this fight goes deep Fugit is going to be tired sloppy and struggling to defend himself and with how dangerous of a striker Kinoshita is very good chance Kinoshita lands the kill shot and knocks him out but for me those odds are just too steep to get me excited you know I'm not interested in betting on fight doesn't go to a decision at uh, big favorite odds just because, you know, if Fugit were to come in with a grappling heavy game plan, he could make it ugly. You know, he could make it like one of these sloppy knockdown drag out fights where Kinoshita keeps giving up cheap takedowns and the fight goes deep. Um, on top of that is Kinoshita's UFC debut. Maybe Octagon jitters result in him fighting, you know, safer, smarter than usual. Maybe start slower and paces himself. For me... You know, if you do want to bet the over-under on this fight, it's got to be on the fight doesn't go to a decision. But I don't think you're getting a great risk-to-reward ratio there. Uh, for me, those odds just do not get me excited. Now, in terms of prop bets, I think the obvious one is Kinoshita by knockout or TKO. Again, the odds don't get me excited, but if you really want to place a prop bet on this fight, that is the one that I would go with. Let me know what you think in the comments. I mean, if you think I've missed anything out, if I'm reading this one wrong, if you're going to be betting this fight, let me know. But for now, let's move on to the next fight, which is the return of Du Ho Choi, the Korean Superboy. So, it wasn't that long ago that Du Ho Choi was being talked about as a potential future UFC champion. And it's kind of crazy how fast sentiment within the MMA community can change, where... From one minute you can go, you know, one minute you can be a potential future champion to the next minute being called a bum and overrated and all hype, right? The, 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 like, the, the mob mentality can change very quickly. But I think in a matchup like this, it is very important to remember, even though Choi has suffered some bad losses on paper... The skills he demonstrated in the first place that got him into a position where people were calling him a potential future champion mean that he's really good. Like, fundamentally, he's really good. And so, I think what's interesting about this matchup is that it's one of those classic examples of the UFC trying to gift somebody a win you know this card was originally scheduled to take place in korea and we know from when Duho Choi used to appear on ufc events in korea that he's a big star over there he's very popular people love him i don't think it's any 
surprised that they've matched him up against someone who is a very good stylistic matchup for him, to say the least. And as a result, I would expect Duho Choi to do really well this weekend. Now, if we take a look at the odds, we can see that Duho Choi is a moderate favourite. He's currently around an average of 1.55, which is minus 182 for an implied probability of 65%. We take a look at his opponent, Carl Nelson. He's around an average of 2.55, which is going to be plus 155 for an implied probability of 39%. So I think one of the main reasons why Duho Choi is not a bigger favourite in this fight is obviously to do with the fact that he suffered some bad losses, right? He's coming into this matchup on the back of a three-fight losing streak. But it's also the layoff. We haven't seen him, you know, for a very long time. He's been out for almost four years. You know, haven't seen him since December 2019. We know ring rest is a very real thing. We know that the long layoff can, you know, often badly derail a fighter's career and, and trajectory of improvement. But on the flip side... It's also possible that Du Ho Choi is a lot better now than he was back when we last saw him in 2019. It's very possible he could have made big improvements, you know, in the four years that he's been out. And at 31 years old, he's still in his prime. You know, one thing I would say about Du Ho Choi, something that possibly led to this three-fight losing streak, was that he was one of these guys that was incredibly reckless, right? He just loved the scrap. He was one of these guys who loved to come forward, take control of the center of the octagon, bait you into exchanging with him. And he relied on his chin, his toughness, and his technique to come out on top over yours. And of course, when he ran into guys like, you know, Cub Swanson, who also very technical, also tough as nails, guys like Jeremy, Jeremy Stevens, who has absolute nuclear bombs in his hand and you can't really afford to be taking clean hot, hard shots from a guy like Stevens. You know, he found out that this aggressive, reckless style that enabled him to run through you know, pretty much everyone that he'd ever fought up until he faced Cub Swanson, um, it just wasn't going to it, it just wasn't going to be a sustainable style in the UFC where as you start to face higher level guys, they've got the technique, the power, the ability to punish you. You know, you can't afford to be standing in the pocket playing rock and sock and robots with absolute killers like jeremy stevens and duho Choi has found this out the hard way so perhaps he'll come back this weekend just as reckless just as aggressive as ever before maybe he'll get knocked out by cal nelson nelson certainly has power in his hands but there is the potential that over the last four years duho Choi has gone back to the drawing board he's matured a bit now and he will instead look to use his very very high level striking technique to develop a more uh, sustainable safer smarter way of fighting and if he does that i'm very excited to see what duho Choi can do in the division because he's brilliant when he's at his best it would be an absolutely brutally honest he's brilliant he's a ton of fun to watch his striking is absolutely superb now duho Choi has been out for four years doing mandatory military service in korea and anecdotally, I've been watching MMA for 20 years. I've been betting on MMA for about 14 years now. What I can tell you is the mandatory military service for Korean fighters doesn't usually have a detrimental effect on them. Uh, most, you know, every Korean UFC fighter has had to go off and do it. And usually, they, they, you know, they pick up right where they left off. It doesn't have really too much of a negative impact on them. So anecdotally... I wouldn't be too concerned with the layoff for Choi. Um, I'm guessing it's probably because in the military, they probably get a lot of time to train. Maybe they get some protection. If they're professional athletes, maybe they get like, um, you know, relaxed duties or something. For example, I know in the British military, you know, if you're an athlete, you know, if you're a football player, if you're a boxer, you get a lot of time in the military to actually train your craft. So I don't know if that's the same in the Korean military. But it could potentially be one of the reasons why the long layoff while they're on military service doesn't really derail their careers too much. But I'm just talking anecdotally. I haven't really got any data to back this up. It's just a trend I've noticed you know, over the last 14 years since I've been betting this. So I'm not overly concerned with the layoff here. Um, in terms of their age, like I say, both guys 31 years old. In terms of the size, both guys roughly the same size. 
Duho Choi 5'10", 70 inch reach. Nelson 5'11", 71 inch reach. Nothing too notable to talk about there. Now, in terms of how these two match up from a stylistic point of view, if this fight stays standing, Carl Nelson is going to get absolutely smoked. Duho Choi's footwork, movement, technique, boxing is up there with some of the best in the division. There's no doubt about that at all. What gets Duho Choi in the trouble on the feet, and the reason why he's lost to Charles Jordan, Jeremy Stevens, and Cub Swanson, is not down to his technique. It's on it, it, the, the reason why he's losing to these guys is down to his um, his recklessness and his desire to take gambles. So if Duho Choi would have just remained technical and stuck to the fundamentals and the basics against Stevens, Jordan, and Swanson. He'd likely be coming into this fight, you know, <laughs> having beaten all of them. But Duho Choi's problem is that he loves a scrap. He loves to go to war. He loves to get into big exchanges. And when you engage in this type of fight, when you put yourself in a position to knock your opponent out, you also put yourself in a position to be knocked out. And if you go back and watch Duho Choi's last three fights, a trend you'll notice is that he's winning all of them until he suddenly eats a clean hard shot which completely flips the fight on his head and swings momentum in his opponent's favor. The Duho Choi is one of these guys that kind of beats himself. He gets himself into a lot of trouble by taking unnecessary risks. So if Duho Choi stays technical, stays disciplined, focuses on not getting into any big exchanges and uses his superior technique to outclass Nelson, on the feet, he's going to absolutely dominate here. He should do really, really well. But, if Duho Choi comes into this fight like he has in the past, looking to play rock and sock and robots, looking to knock Nelson out in a big exchange, he will be taking risks because Nelson is an aggressive guy with power in his hands and he does have legit one-shot knockout power. You know, Polo Reyes found this out the hard way. He landed an absolute nuclear bomb on Polo Reyes and put him away. He could absolutely do the same thing to Duho Choi if Choi comes out, you know, looking to exchange big. So on the feet, shouldn't be a contest, but Nelson could land the kill shot. The one area where this fight could get problematic for Choi is grappling. And... It's difficult to quantify how much of an edge Nelson will have when it comes to grappling. Because there's not that much footage available on Choi's takedown offense and ground game. Even after 18 fights, Choi's takedown offense and ground game is still a bit of an unknown. Mostly because he's starched everyone so quickly because of how good his striking is. Now, what I will say about this fight is similar to what I will say about the fight between Kinoshita and Fugit, in that Nelson's offensive wrestling and ground game isn't great. You know, a big issue with Nelson's offensive wrestling is he tends to shoot in way too high above his opponent's hips when looking for takedowns, which makes it very easy to dig under hooks and neutralize the threat of his grappling. If you want to see an example of what I'm talking about, go check out his last fight against Jay Herbert. We know Herbert's takedown offense and ground game is very bad. But simply by creating a wide base against the cage and digging underhooks, Nelson really struggled to get Herbert down and hold him down. So a basic level of takedown defense is going to be enough to neutralize the threat of Nelson's grappling. But we don't know if Choi really has that basic level of takedown offense and ground games. We haven't really seen him face a grappler. I think one thing that's going to help Choi in this fight is that Nelson doesn't usually commit too hard to his grappling and the harder Nelson tries to grapple the faster he gets tired so even if Nelson were to have a bit of success with his grappling early the cost would likely be he'd become too tired to defend himself in the fight late on and of course we've seen Nelson get finished a few times late on because of how much he slows down he's lost two fights in the third round against Quarantillo and Sales we know Choi has got a pretty good gas tank he showed that off in the war against Cub Swanson and so, the longer the fight goes, the better it gets for du Duho Choi. So, this is one of those fights where I never thought I would be saying this, but Duho Choi is actually a very, very tempting bet. Like a really, really tempting bet. Because the way I would look at this is aside from Nelson scoring a flash KO, the probability of him troubling Duho Choi on the feet 
is very low. Even though we don't know a lot about Duho Choi's takedown offence and ground game, even if Nelson was able to take Choi down and cause him a lot of problems on the ground, Nelson likely doesn't have the gas tank or cardio to make the most of that over the 15 minutes. And at some point, you'd expect Nelson to be too tired to take Choi down and hold him down, in which case Choi would then be able to run away with the fight on the feet and most likely knock Nelson out on the feet with how big the skill gap is when it comes to striking. So this is one of those fights where I've had to put a lot of thought into what to do. And I haven't fully made my mind up on it yet. I'm still on the fence. But my problem with this fight is it is a great stylistic matchup for Choi. And I think the UFC have cherry-picked Carl Nelson as an opponent for Choi to try and gift him a win, to try and get him back in the win column, to try and get his career back on track. He's a very popular, exciting fighter. He would be a big you know, a big boost to the featherweight division, right? Another fight that we can really get excited about. The problem I have with betting Choi this weekend is that he is a relatively big favourite. And there are issues with him that we can't ignore. Predominantly the long layoff. The tendency to fight very recklessly. And also the fact that we don't know a lot about his takedown offence and ground game. So this is one of those fights where I am not interested in betting Carl Nelson. It's a bad stylistic matchup for him. I wouldn't even entertain that. But it is very difficult for me to get over the line with a bet on Duho Choi. Because with his odds carrying an implied probability of 65%. Realistically, if I'm going to bet someone in this odds range, I don't want them to have any major weaknesses or you know any you know any big issues that their opponent could potentially exploit and so if if Duho Choi just had one of the three main weaknesses that I've mentioned I may have pulled the trigger on him but for him to have three glaring weaknesses that Nelson could potentially exploit for me, the risk to reward ratio just isn't good. So I have to pass on this one. But it's a very reluctant pass. And I do think Duho Choi wins a really good percentage of the time. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you're going to be taking the shot on Choi, if you're going to be betting Nelson, which I definitely wouldn't recommend. But let me know what you think. Before we wrap up talking about this fight, though, let's take a look at the over-unders, the prop bets. Do we even have over-unders? Where are the over-unders? We've got props, but the over-unders aren't here. Um, that is a little strange. Oh, guys. Okay, so we can't even look at the over-unders because they're not on best fight odds. We'll take a look at the props instead. I would imagine the odds on this fight not to go to a decision. Pretty steep anyway, if I had to guess. Uh, with how dangerous both guys are, how reckless they are, how bad Nelson's cardio is. So there's probably no upside in betting the, uh, the fight not to go to a decision anyway. If we look at the prop bets on this one, Choi by knockout is, is the obvious one. And again, we don't have any odds for that. So, prop bets. Uh, can't really talk about them. Let's move on to the next fight. So, now let's break down the fight between Marcin Tybura and Blagoj Ivanov. So, if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that it is one of only two fights in the even money odds range on this card, with every other fight featuring a heavy favourite. So, we can see Ivanov is the favorite sorry Tybura is the favorite at average odds of around 1.73 which is going to be minus 137 for an implied probability of 58 percent and if we take a look at the odds on his opponent even of he is around an average of 2.15 which is going to be plus 115 for an implied probability of 47 percent so even of 36 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 73 inch reach. Machin Dabura, 37 years old, 6 foot 3 with a 78 inch reach. So the only real notable thing for us to talk about in terms of X factors is the size difference between these two. Ivanov, one of the smallest heavyweights in the division at 5 foot 11 with a 73 inch reach. For context, this uh, height and reach is typical of what you would see of fighters in the lightweight division. So 
Ivanov very very undersized for a heavyweight. Obviously, he's a big boy in terms of you know mass and weight, but in terms of wingspan, he is very small for a heavyweight. Tybura, on the other hand, six foot three with a seventy eight inch reach. He's got a good wingspan for a heavyweight, and I really feel like the size difference between these two is potentially going to cause even of really big problems and fundamentally it is the reason why i lean towards tybura in this matchup if both guys were roughly the same size you know skill for skill i would probably lean towards even of but i think tybura's size advantage here will make it difficult for even of to have success on the feet and i think it will enable tybura to have extra success when it comes to grappling so there's a lot of things that even of does better than Tybura, but i think the size difference will make it very very hard for him to you know execute those advantages so what do i mean by that so when it comes to striking the one issue that i have with even of is that he's very one-dimensional he is a guy that likes to just plod forward and look to come forward and just box you up basically he is a pure boxer he's not that fast um you know he's not particularly good at getting inside on guys and he's a bit slow and clunky with his movement he's also not the best defensively now he does have a granite chin and he is tough as nails and he does fight at a decent pace but he is a little one-dimensional you don't see even of throw that many kicks You'll never see him try and take his opponents down. Aside from grinding on them in the clinch or looking to box their face off in the middle of the octagon, Ivanov doesn't bring a whole lot to the table. He is definitely a better boxer, definitely a better striker than Tybura from a technical perspective. But in the, con in the context of mixed martial arts, you want to have a lot of weapons and a lot of options that you can use to beat your opponent. I feel Ivanov's range of weapons is too limited where he's only really bringing boxing to the table. And while he may be a better boxer than Tybura, Tybura probably does everything else a bit better than Ivanov and, 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 and that all adds up. So when you look at Tybura, obviously, defensively, he's not great. His boxing isn't great. He's quite sloppy on the feet and he's got a, you know he's got a habit of getting dinged right we've seen tybura get rocked dropped wobbled and knocked out many times in his career but i don't think it's going to be a huge issue against Ivanov because if you look at Ivanov's record you can see that he is a bit of a decisionator he doesn't really have much power in his hands and He's one of these guys that is very much a volume striker. And I think that comes from his size. Because he is so small for a heavyweight, he just doesn't really have the power in his hands to hurt these big guys. And with Tybura having you know, a nice 5-inch reach advantage and being one of these guys that's quite light on his feet, likes to move around a lot, doesn't like to stand right in front of you, it is going to be difficult for Ivanov to get inside and land clean hard shots on Tybura. Because Tybura's got this really awkward, clunky style where he likes to be all the way outside of a range where he can be hit, chipping away at you with like range finding kicks or blitzing forward, working for takedowns. But he doesn't really stand in that boxing range where Ivanov could use his superior technique to kind of pick Tybura apart. So I think the footwork, the movement, the awkward striking style of Tybura and the reach advantage it's just going to make it really difficult for Ivanov to do good work on the feet. And while I do think it can be a competitive fight on the feet, I could even see Ivanov edging the fight on the feet. I don't feel Ivanov is going to be able to cause Tybura a lot of problems or inflict a lot of damage. If Ivanov were to win this fight on the feet, he would only edge it. I don't see him going out there and smoking Ivanov, uh, smoking Tybura on the feet. I also don't see Tybura smoking Ivanov on the feet, but that doesn't matter because I don't see this fight being determined by striking at all. I think one area where Tybura has a pretty big advantage in this matchup is on the ground. And while we haven't seen a whole lot of Ivanov's takedown offense and ground game in recent years, because if you look at his record, he's predominantly been fighting strikers. When you do dig a little bit deeper on Blagoy Ivanov's takedown offense and ground game, you can see that it really isn't good. And this has been kind of 
hidden uh, over the last few years by the fact that no one's really tested his takedown offensive ground game because, like I say, he's been fighting strikers. Look at it. Since he came into the UFC for Junior DeSantos striker, Ben Rothwell never tries to take guys down. Tuivasa, striker. Lewis, never tries to take guys down. Sakai, never tries to take guys down. Marcos Rosario de Lima does try to take guys down, but offensive wrestling isn't the best. And ironically, he did actually take Ivanov down in the third round of this fight. So Ivanov, even though he's trained at AKA for a big chunk of his career, even though he's got a base in combat sambo, whenever I've seen guys try to take Ivanov down, they've been able to get him down quite easily and he does look very very weak off his back so Marcin Tybura isn't one of these guys that is a particularly good offensive wrestler but he does try to take his opponents down in every fight he does tend to use grappling heavy game plans he does tend to try and avoid engaging on the feet and then steal rounds with takedowns and the thing is with the size difference in this matchup Tybura is going to be able to use those long arms to control the body uh, of Ivanov in the clinch to work for you know body lock takedowns if he gets in deep on the legs and hips of Ivanov it's going to be easier for Tybura to connect his hands around Ivanov's legs and yank him away from the octagon based on how bad Ivanov's takedown offense and ground games looked in the past how good Tybura's offensive wrestling looks at times he's got good double leg entries I think Tybura is going to be able to get his fight to the ground uh, at some point in this fight certainly in two of the three rounds and when he does it isn't going to be easy for someone that is five foot eleven on the bottom to shake off a big heavy you know physically imposing dude to six foot three on top of them so that's why Tybu is my lean in this matchup it's one of the more interesting fights on this card with it being one of only two fights in the even money odds range my lean's definitely Tybu here let me know what you think though in the comments below am i reading this one incorrectly do you think even I was going to be able to deal with the threat of Tybu's grappling just fine. For me, the way I look at this is, if you got two guys that, you know, don't really have a huge edge over the other when it comes to striking, naturally you've got to look at what else could determine the outcome of this matchup. And for me, grappling is an area where Tybu's got a big edge. So by process of elimination it makes sense to lean towards Tybura in this fight to me but you know ultimately it's a fist fight to the death anything can happen I don't feel crazy confident in Tybura but I do think he's the strongest side to be on in this fight this weekend if you want to bet this matchup uh, I, I think Tybura is the better side to be on personally from what I've seen now in terms of the over under on this matchup as we can see, even though the majority of heavyweight fights end inside the distance, we can see that Ivanov is a decision maker. Both these guys are tough as, uh, sorry, a decisionator. Both these guys tough as nails, very difficult to finish. We can see Tybura tends to fight to a lot of decisions himself for a heavyweight. So with both these guys being tough, both of them fight into a decision the majority of the time. Um, you know, if you really do want to bet the over and under on this one, you've got to go with fight to go to decision. However, at odds are 1.50 minus 200, which carry an implied probability of 67%. For me, I don't feel you're getting a particularly good risk to reward ratio betting that when you take into consideration the fact that Ivanov is very undersized and doesn't look particularly good at defending himself on the ground. So if Tybura were to get him down and obtain dominant positions, Ivanov may really struggle to defend himself on the ground. And on the feet, we see Martin Tybura get rocked, dropped, wobbled a lot. So probably, you know, probably best to just stay away from that one. Um, you know, I hate to be boring, but for me, not much upside in betting on this. Now, in terms of the prop bets, we do have, uh, obviously, a lean on this fight going deep to a decision. The odds on Ivanov and Tybura to win by decision aren't great. I would probably stay away from this one, man. For me, very difficult to find value on, on any of the props there. So, now, let's move on to talking about the co-main event of this card. It's a strange co-main event, but... It's a co-main event nonetheless. Da Eun Jung versus Devin Clark. So, if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Da Eun Jung is a pretty big favourite. 
odds are around 1.41, which is minus 244 for an implied probability of 71%. We take a look at the odds on Devin Clark. He's around an average of 3.0, which is plus 200 for an implied probability of 33%. So my feelings on this matchup are very similar to my feelings on the matchup between Du Ho Choi and Carl Nelson, in the sense that this is a really good stylistic matchup for Da Eunjung, and I would expect him to win a high percentage of the time. My problem is that his odds kind of reflect that. You know, his odds carry an implied probability of 71%, and even though this is a really good stylistic matchup for him, and I expect him to win a big percentage of the time, there are enough glaring weaknesses with Da Eunjung, and enough things that Devin Clark does well which makes me very apprehensive to bet Young at big favourite odds. But I give you all the information you need to make your own decision on this one. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. So let's go through it. If we look at the tail of the tape, Da Eun Jung is 29 years old, 6 foot 4, with a 78 and a half inch reach. Devin Clark, 32 years old, 6 foot tall, with a 75 inch reach. So both guys roughly the same age, nothing major going on there. Da and Jung is longer and he is taller. Devin Clark has that small, compact, muscular frame. So two different body types, Da and Jung longer, leaner, taller. Clark more compact, more muscular. So this is a classic striker versus grappler matchup. If the fight stays standing, you would expect Da Eun Jung to do really well. He's a much more technical striker than, than, than Devin Clark. He's got good boxing, you know, good technique, fights at a high pace. What I really like about Da Eun Jung is that he can fight at a high pace through a high volume of strikes over 15 minutes and not really slow down. Devin Clark isn't comfortable on the feet. He's not particularly good defensively. He's not particularly dangerous offensively either. But what I will say about Devin Clark is that his striking does need to be respected. What you notice about Devin Clark is because he's very uncomfortable on the feet and he doesn't react well to pressure and he's not good defensively. What you'll often see from him at times is that he will fight in a state of panic. In terms of it will get to the point where he's so uncomfortable on the feet that he will literally just close his eyes, bite down on his mouthpiece and swing for the fences. And when he does that, he does throw everything that he's got into the shots and he can hurt you. You know, we've seen him ding a good number of guys in the past. He hurt Alonzo Menefield. He can hurt you on the feet. He needs to be respected. Having said that, he's not very technical, whereas Da Eunjung is. So... Clark could absolutely hulk out and land a bomb on Jung on the feet, but it's not a particularly likely outcome. What I will say, though, is that you need to bear it in mind, simply because we have seen Da and Jung get caught in his last fight by Dustin Jacoby. It only takes one shot to knock him out, but it's not particularly likely. Da and Jung should have a huge advantage on the feet here. Now, similar to Kinoshita, Sorry, actually, similar to uh, Du Ho Choi that we were talking about, you know, earlier in this breakdown video, there's not a whole load of footage available on Da Eun Jung's takedown defense and ground game. But if you go pretty far back in his career, you can find flashes of his takedown defense and ground game against some pretty low-level grapplers. And from what I've seen, it looks very good. So... When it comes to Da Eun Jung, we can't be totally sure that he's going to neutralize the threat of Devin Clark's offensive wrestling. But from what I've seen, he's got a pretty good chance of doing so. The problem is, if you look at his fights in the UFC so far, Kadis Ibragimov, striker. Mike Rodriguez, striker. Sam Alvey, striker. William Knight, awful grappler. Kennedy and Chuck Wu, striker. Dustin Jacoby, striker. So the problem with Da Eun Jung, like a lot of guys on this card, he hasn't really fought any really good grapplers that could test his takedown offense and ground game. Now, I'm not saying Devin Clark is a really good grappler, but he is a pretty decent offensive wrestler. I think he was a Duco national champ wrestling or something. Or He's got some, I haven't really looked into the specifics of what he achieved 
at wrestling, but I know he wrestled at a decent level. And his offensive wrestling is pretty good, to be fair. Devin Clark has some of the best double leg takedown entries in the division. When he fully commits to his takedowns, it's very difficult to stop him. And I think one of the reasons why Devin Clark's offensive wrestling is so good is because his body type lends itself quite well to taking down these longer, taller, light heavyweights. Because at six foot tall, with a 75 inch reach, Clark is on the smaller side for smaller side of the size equation for light heavyweights so with him being naturally shorter with a compact body type when he does shoot these double leg takedowns he naturally gets in really deep on on his opponent's legs and hips so his offensive wrestling is really really good and we certainly haven't seen Da Eun Jung face anyone with the level of offensive wrestling that Devin Clark is bringing to the table so it is a unique challenge for Jung this weekend and hopefully this fight answers a lot of questions about Jung's defensive wrestling and takedown defense. I don't think Clark is going to be able to cause Jung too many problems with his wrestling this weekend. Predominantly because Jung's takedown defense and ground games look decent. And on top of that, Clark doesn't tend to use his grappling that much. He shoots the odd takedown here and there. But he's not really persistent with it. He doesn't chain wrestle a lot. So what you're likely to see from Clark is he may shoot an amazing double leg takedown. And put Da Eun Jung on his back. But then if Da Eun Jung works his way back up to his feet in 30-40 seconds. He probably won't see Clark go back to a takedown for a good couple of minutes. Which then will enable Jung to outscore him by a wide margin with his strikes on the feet. So I don't think that Clark is going to have that much success with his grappling in this fight. But it is certainly a path to victory for him. And if Clark does come into this matchup with a really, really grappling heavy game plan, which he's capable of, he's got a decent gas tank, he's got good offensive wrestling, he's got good MMA grappling, then uh, I could see him causing Jung a lot of problems. What is interesting about Devin Clark, though, and something strange MMA grapplers, who is a very good offensive wrestler, but very bad defensively. So what I mean by that is, Clark's double leg takedown entries are fantastic. They're some of the best in the division. But what's strange about Clark is if he finds himself on his back, he is very, very weak off his back. Which is something to consider because we know when we've seen Jung, you know, use grappling heavy game plans against guys like William Knight, his offensive wrestling is pretty good. He's quite heavy from top position. So if he finds a way to get into top position on Clark in like a crazy scramble or, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? MMA is a chaotic sport. Um, don't be surprised to see Jung have a lot of success against Clark on the ground. I could certainly see that happening as well. So what does this mean from a betting point of view? I think Jung wins this fight a high percentage of the time. Unfortunately, his odds reflect that. Very difficult for me to get excited about betting Jung at these odds at an implied probability of 71%. Uh, just not much upside in betting him in that odds range for me. I'm not interested in betting Devin Clark this weekend because it is a very tough fight for him. Uh, if you really, really want to bet this fight, you've got to take Jung. But I would, uh, I would really question how much of a deal you're getting with these odds. For me, it is an easy pass. But you might feel differently. Let me know in the comments below. If we take a look at the fight in terms of over-unders, I actually think it's quite likely that this fight will go to a decision. Um, not ne It's not necessarily the best... Uh, this fight going to a decision is not necessarily the most likely outcome. But I do feel it is the over-under that gives you the best risk-to-reward ratio. For me, neither guy is like crazy dangerous. So Devin Clark, not that dangerous on the feet. Da Eun Jung is quite tough. When you look at Da Eun Jung, he's more of a volume striker. So it's not like he has you know, devastating one-shot knockout power in his hands. He tends to break you down with volume and chip away at you. Now, we have seen Devin Clark capitulate and fold in fights and just kind of throw the towel in. But at the same time, if you look at his run in the UFC, most of his fights go deep. So, right back when to, when he made his uh, debut in 2016, you know, this one went to a decision, 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 decision. And these fights went deep, right? They went into the third round. If you look at Da and Jung's record, his last two fights have ended quickly. But um, since he made his debut, this one went deep in the third round. You know, this one went to a decision. This one went to a decision. So the way I would look at this is, I think this is a classic example of where you just let the odds do the work for you. 
if we look at Clark and Jung's record records, it seems like 50% of the time their fights end inside the distance. 50% of the time their fights go to a decision. So from my perspective, why would you want to bet on fight not to go to a decision? At odds of 1.50 minus 200 for an implied probability of 67% when we know it's kind of 50-50 whenever these guys fight whether the fight's going to go to a decision or not. For me, that would be a foolish bet. You're much better off betting on the fight to go to a decision or over two and a half rounds at odds of 2.50 plus 150 for an implied probability of 40%, because we know if 50% of the time Clark and Jung fight, it goes with decision, and 50% of the time it ends inside the distance. If you bet the over as opposed to the under at an implied probability of 40%, you are getting a 10% margin over the bookies. Now, of course, that's a really simplified way of looking at it, because we haven't considered how they match up stylistically. But from everything that I've said and myself, uh, considering how they match up stylistically i can't lean either way on the over and i don't really have a strong feeling on it so in that situation if you purely want to bet on value for me betting on the over gives you the better risk to reward ratio i hope that made sense in terms of prop bets for this fight in terms of prop bets for this one um jung by decision i quite like Jung by decision, odds of 4.0, 4.20. I won't be betting it. I don't think it's a particularly strong position for you to put your money. But if you're the kind of person that wants to sprinkle a little bit of money on every fight to watch, watching the fights more entertaining, I think Jung by decision is probably the best prop out of all of them on this matchup this weekend. Hope you found that useful. Now, let's talk about the main event between Derek Lewis and Sergei Spivak. If we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we've got another heavy favourite with Sergei Spivak at odds of 1.44, which is going to be minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. We take a look at the odds on Derek Lewis. He is around an average of 2.85, which is going to be plus 185 for an implied probability of 35%. So Derek Lewis, 37 years old, 6 foot 3, with a 79 inch reach spivak 28 years old six foot three with a 78 inch reach so both guys roughly the same size but there is a big difference in age we can see the spivak is nine years younger than lewis which statistically gives him around a 70 percent chance of winning which is very interesting because when you look at his odds that's exactly where his implied probability is in his odds so the odds pretty much reflect uh, spivak's probability of winning uh, by age but of course we know there's a lot more that goes into predicting the outcome of mma fights than that so let's talk about how these two match up from a stylistic point of view the only other thing i want to mention when it comes to x factors is that spivak is making huge improvements from fight to fight i see him getting better and better every time we see him uh, whereas i do feel Derek lewis is on a decline i feel this is a bit i feel a big part of this is because of the injuries that Lewis deals with we know his knees are beat up we know he's got back problems and all too often we see him get injured in fights and fall apart whereas Spivak young hungry up and coming bull making big improvements from fight to fight both these guys definitely on opposite career trajectories so in terms of how these two match up from a stylistic point of view it's a classic striker versus grappler matchup if the fight stays standing I think Lewis is going to do really well if the fight goes to the ground, I think Spivak is going to do really well. So the key to predicting the outcome of this matchup is working out how 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 likely it is Spivak is able to get this fight to the ground and keep the fight on the ground. Let's talk about striking first of all. When I watch footage of Sergei Spivak, the word that I would use to describe his striking is timid. When it comes to striking, I just don't think Spivak wants to smoke. Whenever you see him get into an exchange on the feet or hurt or run into any trouble on the feet, he immediately turns into a panic wrestler, which is bad news when you're facing someone as aggressive and as dangerous as Lewis on the feet. We know Lewis is the kind of guy that is wild, reckless and absolutely lethal when it comes to striking. He'll throw massive winging combinations you know the the deliver 
crazy knockout power behind every shot that he throws. He'll throw flying knees. He'll just look to overwhelm you and, and throw fucking uppercuts from Hades. Like, this guy is extremely dangerous on the feet. And he ebb and f- ebbs and flows from doing nothing to trying to kill you. Lewis is one of these guys that will stand back, conserve energy, stay in a defensive shell, and not really open up and throw anything at all, to suddenly explode into life with a five-strike combination where he blitzes you and, 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 and tries to take you out. And so Lewis poses a significant threat to Spivak on the feet because I don't think Spivak wants the smoke that Lewis is bringing. I feel this is one of those matchups where Lewis could just blitz Spivak and Lewis uh, and Spivak could just completely capitulate, go down and look for a way out straight away. Kind of similar to what happened against Tom Aspinall. If you go back and watch the Aspinall fight, it only lasted two and a half minutes. But as soon as Spivak realised it wasn't going to be easy to get Aspinall down and hold him down, and every second that that fight was going to be contested on the feet, he was going to be in danger and knocked out, it was almost like Spivak mentally waved the white flag and didn't want to play anymore. So on the feet, I think Lewis gives Spivak absolute hell. And, and it has nothing to do with technique. It has everything to do with gameness. Lewis is down for violence, right? Uh, on the feet, he, he's ready for war. I don't feel Spivak is down for it. And and so, I definitely give Lewis the edge when it comes to striking. But Lewis's Achilles heel throughout his career, his biggest weakness has been his takedown offence and his ground game. We know that Lewis's takedown offence is extremely bad and his ground game is white belt level. And we know that Spivak has evolved into being predominantly a grappler. When he first came into the UFC... He had the predominantly striking-based style of fighting, but now he's very much evolved into being a pretty solid MMA grappler in the heavyweight division. He's got good chain wrestling, good takedown entries, and what I really like about Spivak is that he's persistent. He's one of the very few heavyweights that will not let you off the hook when it comes to grappling. If he takes you down and you pop back up, he'll continue trying to take you down. And that relentless style of grappling, that chain wrestling... Gives him a big edge in the heavyweight division because so many of these heavyweights that slow down as fights wear on will struggle to keep up with the pace he sets when you know they're constantly having to fight off the takedown attempts. The problem with Spivak is he's not a natural grappler. So if you look back to when he made his UFC debut back in 2019, wasn't that long ago. When you look at his fight back in you know 2019 against Walt, Walt Harris, his grappling was extremely low level back then. And for the most part, he was a striker. And since then, he's improved his grappling. The problem with Spivak is that he's still not quite there with his grappling. So while his, takedown def- his offensive wrestling has improved, his chain wrestling's improved, I love how persistent he is. A huge weakness that Spivak still has with his MMA grappling is that his grappling control is very bad. And that's very unusual because technically he's pretty solid and he's a big guy, right? Six foot three with a 78 inch reach. You would think that when a big guy that's six foot three, you know, takes you down, gets on top of you, you'd think it would be very, very difficult for you know, guys he takes down to work out of bad positions that he puts them in. But for whatever reason, that's not the case. And he really struggles to maintain dominant positions for very long. If you want to see what I'm talking about, I would highly recommend that you go and watch his last fight against Augusto Sakai. He did a great job of repeatedly taking Augusto Sakai down and eventually got the finish in round two. But it will surprise you how easy Sakai was able to work his way back up to his feet after being taken down. It would go through a repeating pattern in that matchup where Spivak would get the fight to the ground and Sakai would just pop straight back up to his feet. That's not good because 
what it means is that Spivak is going to be exerting a lot of energy to get these takedowns to achieve very little. Because if you take your opponent down only to see him pop back up, you don't really score very high in the eyes of the judges. And a little bit of effective striking can negate the good work that you did with that takedown. Now, the reason why Augusto Sakai ran into problems in that fight was because when Spivak would take him down and he would pop back up, he just didn't have the striking technique to score points, gain respect in there, hurt Spivak and achieve any success on the feet. But Lewis does, which makes this a much more interesting fight. Because even though Lewis's takedown offense and ground game is very, very bad, Derek Lewis has this tremendous ability to get to his knees when on the ground and just stand back up. The only guy that I've ever been able, the only guy that I can ever recall being able to do this in MMA was Mark Hunt. It, it's very, 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 very difficult to take Mark Hunt and Derek Lewis down and hold them down early in an MMA contest. If you go back throughout Mark Hunt's career, Derek Lewis's career, what you'll notice is when you get these guys down, they will immediately roll to their front, get to their knees and just stand back up. And it doesn't matter how good of a grappler they're facing, the grappler just doesn't seem to be able to stop them from doing it. Now, where you've got visions in your head of Derek Lewis getting absolutely dominated on the ground by Daniel Cormier, or visions of you know Mark Hunt getting wet blanketed by Stipe Miocic, that happens after they've been worn down with chain wrestling and persistent grappling, which Spivak certainly can do. But initially, it's really difficult to hold Derek Lewis down. And so what I could see happening in this fight is Spivak taking Lewis down, Lewis popping back up, and then Lewis giving Spivak absolute hell on the feet and Spivak starting to doubt himself and look for a way out like he did against Tom Aspinall. I don't think Spivak wants the smoke on the feet. And I also, based on Spivak's past performances, I'm not convinced he can take Lewis down and hold him down early. I think in order for Spivak to really get his grappling heavy game plan going, he's going to have to wear Lewis out a decent amount first. And I don't know if he can do that before Lewis knocks him out because Spivak is very sketchy on the feet. So it's a very interesting fight, man. What does all that mean from a betting point of view? You've got to favour Spivak. He's younger, he's hungrier, he's improving. His career is on that upward career trajectory. However, his odds reflect his advantages in my opinion. It's very difficult to find value on Spivak in this odds range when he's facing one of the most devastating and dangerous knockout artists in the history of the heavyweight division. If you are confident that Spivak can avoid getting knocked out when Lewis has been able to put away guys like Chris Dorcas, Curtis Blades, Alexi Olenek, Ilya Latifi, he didn't actually put a little Latifi away. But point being, Dorcas, Blades, Olenek, they're all grapplers too. They can grapple. Dorcas can grapple, right? Lewis was able to find a way to knock out all three guys before they were able to implement a grappling heavy game plan. If you don't think Lewis is capable of doing that to Spivak as well, I don't know what to tell you. I can assure you he is. So for me, there is no way I would bet Spivak this weekend in this odds range. For me, this is dog or pass, no doubt about it. If you really want to bet this fight, you've got to take Lewis. The problem with betting Lewis is you're putting your money in a lot of danger. If you bet Lewis, you're betting on a guy that is injury prone. You're betting on a guy that is old. You're betting on a guy that is declining. And you are betting on a guy who has bad takedown offense and a bad ground game against a decent grappler. So for me, again, sorry to be boring, but the odds on this one are exactly where they should be. Very difficult to find value on either side. When betting on MMA, you want to find those situations where the value is so glaringly obvious that it punches you in the face. And you know that you've got a big edge over the bookies. A classic example of that was our bet on Jamal Hill to beat Glover Teixeira. The research showed that it was going to be extremely difficult for Glover to take Hill down and hold him down. And we knew that if the fight stayed on the feet, Glover would likely get smoked. You would have expected Jamal Hill to be a massive favourite in that type of fight. 
you would have expected Jamal Hill to be in an odds range similar to Sergei Spivak. If I were capping that fight, I would have had Hill at around 1.44 minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. But he wasn't. We were able to bet Hill at odds of 1.80 minus 125 for an implied probability of 56%, which is a huge margin of value over the bookies and was a classic example of where the odds which is very 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 badly off those are the spots you want to find to get your money in in mma betting you know not 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 putting your money in a lot of danger on fights like this where you're not getting a good risk to reward ratio on either side because both guys have got you know clear paths to victory and things that they can do well to cause the other a problem so needless to say with this being a five rounder you know, with how dangerous both guys are in their areas of advantage, this fight probably isn't going to go to a decision. The odds reflect that. So the over-under, very difficult to bet on this fight. Odds are exactly where they should be. In terms of um, in terms of um, prop bets on this one, it's tricky. It is tricky. Spivak by decision. Uh, sorry, Spivak by submission. Spivak by knockout or TKO. I think those are the two most likely outcomes. But the odds aren't great. You know what? Props are dead on this one as well, right? There's no point in betting Lewis by knockout or TKO because the odds aren't that much better on him to win money line. You know, why would you bother, you know, taking on this extra risk just for a little bit more of a bump in the odds when you can just bet Lewis straight, you know? Um, so, yeah, pr pretty dead for prop bets as well. So, I hope you found that breakdown useful. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button below and leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this video. And subscribe if you haven't already. Check out my website, mabettingtips.com. If you like these breakdown videos, you can find breakdowns for all the prelim fights on this card as well over on my website. Link in the description below. But for now, have a great weekend. I hope you crush it. I hope you do well betting the fights this weekend. And we'll be back very soon with some breakdown videos for next week's fantastic card, UFC 284. Headlined by Mr. Volkanovsky and Mr. Makachev. It's going to be a fun one. Have a great week, guys. Love you all. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all very soon. Bye.